We worship you, Lord God. You are the promise keeper. You are the way maker. You're a miracle worker. You're the miracle worker, Lord. All gifts come from you. All good gifts come from you. You're a good God. You never change. We can count on you, Lord God. We're so glad to know you, and we're so thankful that you're who you are in our lives. You've proven yourself faithful over and over again, Lord God. The same God that brought the children of Israel through the desert, across the waters, is the same God that we trust in now. He hasn't changed. We give you glory and honor, Lord. You're so faithful. You came through over and over and over again, Lord. Over and over and over again, you never change. Your goodness never changes. Your givingness never changes. Your love, your kindness, your graciousness never changes. You're constant, Lord God. One sure thing we can count on, and that's you. That's you. You're our hope. You're our rock. You're our anchor. You are steadfast, Lord of God, and you keep us steadfast. You keep us focused. You keep us on the straight truth, Lord God. We give you glory and honor for that, Lord God. You have never failed, and you never will. Hallelujah. We put our total trust in you. We put our confidence in you. It's not in anything shaky. It's not in anything shakable. It's only in you, Lord God. Our confidence, our focus, our trust, it's in you, Lord God. You've always been faithful to us, and you always will. We honor you, Lord God. And we come before you tonight with our hearts tuned in to hear from you. <laughs> you never fail to speak. You never fail to move. You never fail to honor your word and you confirm your word with the signs following. You work together with us, Lord God, as we take your word and work it in our lives. We plant it as seed, and we know that it produces a harvest. You are so faithful, Lord. You are our way maker, our only way, the way, the truth, the life. You are all we will ever need. We give you glory and honor, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Father. Hallelujah. Glory to your name. Hallelujah. We bless you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. He sees every heart. He sees every heart. He sees every situation here. He sees every desire. He sees every person who's cried out and said, God, I need you. I need something. I need an answer tonight. I need to hear from you. I need something to change in my life. God sees that. He sees everything he hears. He, we come to him and he inclines his ear to us. He hears us. And he cares more about us than we'll ever, ever fathom. He cares more about us than we'll ever know. We're just beginning to understand the goodness and the love he has for us. Hallelujah. He gave everything when he gave Jesus. He gave everything when he gave Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory. We praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, it does, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, you are, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Glory to you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Amen. You are. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You are faithful, Lord God. Praise you, Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah. 
Thank you, Susie. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Amen. Thank you. He is our King. We give you glory. We find our rejoicing in you, Lord God. We find our rejoicing in you. You are our King. Hallelujah. We bless you, Lord. You're so good. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You can be seated. Oh, God is so good. God is so good. He is our rejoicing. You know, we worshiped to the song Waymaker. And the names, the Waymaker, Miracle Worker, Promise Keeper, that's just a little bit of his goodness and his faithfulness. Praise God. Isaiah 43, 19 is the scripture that he gave us in that. And it says, I will. He was talking to Israel. And think of all that they went through. They went, came through the Red Sea. He parted the way for them. He brought them out of bondage, and he parted the way for them. And he kept his word, and he brought them through all, all the wilderness. When there was no water, he gave them streams in the desert. It doesn't really matter what the situation. He makes a way when there is no way. That's what he said. Isaiah 43, 19, I'll read it. It says, I will make a pathway through the wilderness. This is God speaking to Israel and to us. I will make a pathway through the wilderness. There was no pathway in the wilderness, but God said he would make a pathway. for. He said he will make our path straight. And he said, I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. When we're trusting him, what the awesome thing is, is we don't have to figure out how he's going to do it. We don't have to figure out where he's going to get it. We don't have to figure out the details. I call him the detail guy. And that is not meant to be, you know, belittling at all. But he's my detail person. He knows every detail. He knows every little thing. I don't have to figure it out. It's such a relief. Praise God. I, but all I have to do, all he asks us to do, is have the faith to believe him, to trust him, and say, God, I don't know where the way is, but you know you're the way maker. I need a straight path. You have the straight path made for me. I need waters in the desert. You've got, you will create them if you have to, because he's so faithful to us. Praise God. So one time when I was having, I'm just, I'm just uh, sharing a few things. Samara's sharing tonight, but I'm just opening up just a few things. Because I know God is so good, and he has so many good things for us. So that's, if you're wondering. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure, speaking. But um, in uh, Matthew 11, 28 through 30, one time I was having one of those days, um, which I think everyone's familiar with. You know, calls deluxe. Um, yeah, that's the right scripture. Calls and um, requests for everything, changes in plans, and so many things I had to take care of, and so many more things to come. And you know how that hits you. You know, you can get really scattered. You can, and you can start thinking ahead, and you start thinking, you know, well, how am I going to get this done? And all the details just start to get to you. And you try not to let it bother you. And you try not to, uh, you know, you try to cast your care on the Lord and keep them cast on the Lord. It's like the old thing, you know, cast your care on the Lord like you're fishing. Well, I, I say a lot of times, yeah, a lot of people reel it right back in and keep it again. We got to cast it and keep on casting it and keep on cast it, cast it on the Lord and not carry our own cares. So that was the kind of day I was having. And he, the Holy Spirit is so good. He said he will remind us of everything that Jesus has spoken to us. 
everything that the Lord has told us. So, of course, you put that word in there, and the Holy Spirit brings this back up. So this is what came up. This is what he spoke to me in um, Matthew 11, verse 28. It was like Jesus himself spoke to me, and he said, Come unto me. So just take this in. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And so the entire day I took that scripture, and I just would repeat it, and then I would forget part and look it up again. And, and he was reassuring me. I just repeated it over and over. When that temptation would come to me to get stressed, to take the cares, to think, how, how am I going to get this done? How am I going to fit this all in? I would repeat, repeat this. Jesus said, come unto me. He's talking about himself. He has everything we need. Come unto me. He didn't say, follow the rules, read 50 books. He just said, come unto me. And we can do that. Lord, I'm, we don't have to figure out what that looks like. We draw near to him. We spend time with him. We listen. Proverbs 4 talks about inclining your ear to him, listening to him. And that's what we do. We come to him, and he does the rest. He performs his word. He keeps us in peace, perfect peace when our mind is stayed on him. Praise God. That's what the word says. I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on me. So there's a lot going on all around us. There are storms all over the place. There's news reports of what's happening. There's contradicting stories everywhere. If you focus on those things, you're going to be troubled. We'll all be troubled when we focus on those things. And we will go up and down with the latest news story. Even discoveries and things that are helpful, well, if you base your trust in those things, you go up and down because they change, they change in a year. I remember when they used to say once your brain cells were dead, they were dead. I mean, that wasn't that long ago. And all of a sudden, they had more research and they figured out, no, your brain cells can regrow. They can regenerate. That's the way God made our bodies. He's just full of life. He made it so good. So you can't base anything on any, this is the only steadfast thing, his word, his goodness. So when I was looking up, a little bit about that when it, Jesus said, I'm meek and lowly of heart. The image that brings up sometimes is something that is not even what he's trying to say. But I just want to read something I said. It said, this meekness is the fruit of power. It's the fruit of power. It's not wimpiness. It's not complacency. It's not ducking your head and taking last place. It's the fruit of power. This is out of Vine's Expository Dictionary. He said, the Lord was meek because he had the infinite resources of God at his command. The opposite, it's the opposite of self-assertiveness and self-interest. It's not just an outward behavior, but it's heart. So when you see that and you think of meekness, lowliness of heart, it's not that last place and that phony humility. True humility is saying, I don't have this in myself, but I trust the Lord. I, I trust the Lord. That is true humility, not being last on the totem pole, lowest on the totem pole. So the Lord is saying, he just got through in the book of John there, he's talking about how the Father has life in himself, and he gave that life to me, and I share that life. I do nothing of my own. I do what I hear the Father, uh, see the Father do, and I say what I, he, I hear him say. So that is meek and lowliness of heart, meekness and lowliness of heart. And that's the quality that he gave us. So it's the fruit of power. Praise God. Um, turn to John 14, the book of John. Just some things the Lord had been speaking to me that apply to all of us. Praise God. And this is interesting. I'll just read it off the screen. It's up. 
It says, now this is Jesus talking about himself, and it seems so strange because he was sharing, and this doesn't make sense at first glance, but it has to do with coming to him, looking to him, focusing on him, and it's how we can get through any situation, any trouble, any storm, any sickness, any challenge. It's how we can make it through and stay stable. But Jesus was talking, and he talked about himself, and he said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Um, verse, the next verse, that whosoever believes in him, whoever believes in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life, life as God has it. Praise God. And Jesus said that about himself, and it he was quoting something out of Numbers 21 when they were in the wilderness. The children of Israel were in the wilderness. And it already said the land was full of serpents, scorpions, all kinds of creep, creeping things. And they were under the protection of God. But they got into a time when they were challenging God and blaming him. And Moses too. And they sinned. And they came to Moses later and said, we sinned. Against God, we sinned against you. But when that happened, the protection of God that had been there all along protecting them, they, you can choose. The word says, I tell you this day, choose life or death, therefore choose life. When we choose the way he's made us as our way maker of life, we, we're choosing blessing. We're walking in blessing. But when we choose any other way, we're going to end up with whatever's there. And so that's what happened to them. And so they came to Moses because these snakes were biting them, serpents, fiery serpents, it called them. They were being bitten, and it was quite a scene, I'm sure, of fear and panic. You know, I'm just, I can't even begin to think about it. But they came, and they said, we've sinned. What can we do? And God told Moses to lift up, to make a brass serpent, and lift it. And this is what Jesus is referring to here to lift it up on a pole. And if they would look steadfastly, um, it's, it's, it wasn't just a glance. It wasn't just a um, look and then look at the snakes and then look around and, and deal with the fear and run for a while. And It was to steadfastly, in, with an intent, focused, not breaking your gaze, stare at, focus. And it doesn't make any sense. You know, no mental sense, but it worked because it was what God said to do. So as long as they focused and absorbed their glance and their gaze on that brass serpent, they were healed, they were not bitten, everything was taken care of. And the Lord took care of the situation because they came back in. And, and what Jesus said, that was a type of me. And does that make sense when you think about it? He's our precious savior why on earth would it be a snake that he said this was me this is like me i must be lifted up and all men will come unto me and he was comparing himself but when you study the covenant and what jesus did for us when he came and he redeemed us he completely took our sin upon himself he knew no sin but he was made to be sin for us that we might be made or given freely the righteousness of God in Christ. He was made to be sin. And so that he was made, the sickness came upon him. Our grief came, came upon him. Our sorrow, our sadness, our poverty, all sickness, it came upon Jesus. So the lifting up of the serpent, it was the curse the curse that came upon him and settled on him, and he carried it for us, and he did away with it. And the reason he did that is so that the blessing of Abraham would come on us. Praise God. He took us out of darkness and into the light, out of something and into something good. He always does that. He translates us into something good. So in Jesus saying this, that's the point. I mean, there are so many illustrations in the word of focus. And Jesus himself said that's how he got through the sorrow, the grief of the cross. He focused on the prize that was set before him. The joy 
that was set before him. He was focusing on you and I. Praise God. He was seeing the work that was going to be done. So hallelujah. That's the way he made it through. He looked beyond the junk to the goal. And that's the way we make it through. So we focus on him. So no matter what's going on in our lives, I'm just saying, that brought me great peace that day to have him speak to me and say, come unto me, all you who, who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest isn't just how many hours we sleep. Rest is complete peace and wholeness. Hallelujah. You can sleep the days away and still not have rest. God is good. He provides everything we need. So anyway, I wanted to share those things and, and um, invite Samara to come up. <laughs> Hallelujah. She was such a blessing to share with us the last time and didn't mean to surprise you there. <laughs> um, you didn't see the reaction I got when I said Samara. <laughs> but um, just want to thank her for the good word she brought last time and know that um, God's got so, sometimes when you're studying, you get part way through and you think, oh, I could use like two more sermons to get all that out because he puts so much good stuff in you. So anyway, praise God. We we thanking you, appreciate you and believe that God's big in you. And um, the spirit of God is here. He's wonderful. He's mighty and he's supplying every need. And Lord, we just look to you and we thank you for your supply tonight. We thank you for living big in Samara. I thank you for the word that you've given her. And we receive it, Lord God. We open up our ears. We open up our hearts. And we listen, Lord God, with, with open hearts to hear your word to us tonight. We thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Linda. That was a wonderful, wonderful word. the Lord. Hello, ladies. How are you? That was so wonderful. I'm so thankful for our church. I'm so thankful for uh, the attendees. I'm so thankful for our leadership. I'm, I'm so thankful for our pastors. I'm thankful for uh, literally like the whole shebang. Like the, this church has literally changed my life. And I am so grateful to be here and to be ministering to you guys. I'm so excited to you ladies. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Um, just real quick, uh, thank you, Jesus, so much for uh, today, and I thank you, Lord, that nothing will come from me and it will all come from you, and I am so grateful to be used as your vessel, and thank you, Lord, that we will open our hearts and our ears and our minds, and that we will receive the word that you want us to have. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so just a quick summary of the last time that we got together. Uh, we talked about what happens when we get saved. And when we get saved, um, we become a new creature, right? The old creature is taken away, and the new creature, the light, is now um, inside of us. So then we live from the inside out. And we are now the righteousness of God, right? It's because his rightness is inside of us, so we are made righteous through him. And our feelings about ourselves don't matter anymore when it comes to our identity, because our identity now is in Christ. It's in his righteousness and who he is and what he's done for us. So, and we also learn to put on our armor every day, right? So that we can dodge the fiery darts of the devil. I did my little, <laughs> my little moves. <laughs> and we have to fight for our life. We have to, every single day, make the choice to fight and to live in him every day. And it can be hard, but we can do it. And like Pastor Jeff and um, Pastor Kurt uh, said before, we have to plant seeds in our lives so that they can grow. Um, you have to put God first. God gave us, again, God gave us the power of choice, and we have to choose every day to lean on him. And like Jeff said on Thursday, uh, our whole world benefits from it when we do that. Uh, our, you know, your marriage, if you're married, your kids, your, your work life, your social life, you're happier you know, from the inside out. That's how it works. That's, how, that's what happens when you get saved. That's why I say people are the best people. <laughs> um, so what we, want to do, what we wanted to do and what we wanted to get across to everyone with the Valentine's Day cards, if you guys came on um, Thursday, was that 
they, they, they were Valentines from God, and we wanted you to know that you are valuable to him, and you're valuable to us. Okay, everyone plays a part and everyone has a role and we're all here for each other, to lean on each other and to love each other no matter what, right? We don't, we don't judge each other. We all have our issues that we're working on through him, right? And we can help hold each other accountable for it too. So that's, that's why we're here together. Always remember that um, God loves you and that he wants you to succeed. That is very important. Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do works which God prepared us to do, I'm sorry, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Let me get my pointer, it helps me. Isaiah uh, 64, 8. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. And then Psalms 46, 5. God is within her. My favorite verses are the ones that say her, because we are ladies. Although the, the ones about men apply to us as well. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day, which is morning. So, praise the Lord. The, the, there are different, I'm sorry, the different verses that we handed out for the Valentine's Day. Um, talked about different things that we are in him, right? One was healed, because we are healed through him. Uh, Psalms 32, O Lord my God, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. Um, we are, uh, one was beloved. Song of Solomon 6, 3, I am my beloved's, and he is mine. Did anybody else remember that song from like way back in like children's camp? Like, I am my beloved and he is mine. His banner over me is love. All right. <laughs> my, my, uh, my friends and my sister's friends always joke that being involved in our lives is like being in a musical because we kind of, anything reminds us of a song. We're like, oh, ah, and we just burst out into song randomly. <clears throat> so, beloved, here we are. Uh, the adjective definition, because I wanted to know what beloved meant, because it sounds like you would know what it means. And from the last time, uh, you might remember, I really like words and definitions of words and how, what they actually mean, because we all sometimes can assume we know something, but it's not always the case. So the adjective version, version of it is a much-loved person. And the example they gave was, he watched his beloved. And the synonyms, right, which are words that are similar to that, were sweetheart, loved one, love, True love, lady love, I like that one too, darling, dearest, and dear one. And the noun, which is a person, place, or thing, the noun was dearly loved, the definition for beloved. And the synonyms for that were very similar. Darling, dear, dearest, precious, adored, loved, much loved, favorite, cherished, treasured, and prized. These are all wonderful things. Deuteronomy 33, 12. The beloved of the Lord dwells in safety. We are his beloved, and we are safe within him. Another one was chosen. Colossians 3, 12. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts. And we're going to dig into Colossians a little bit later. Uh, and another one was restored. We are restored in him. Psalms 33. O Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. She, she I think. What does it say on that one? Uh, it, it says S-H-E-O-L in the version that I had. So <clears throat> I looked that one up too. Give me a minute. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. So Sheol, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, when the Hebrew scriptures were translated into Greek in ancient Alexandria around 200 BC, the word Hades, the Greek underworld, was substituted for Sheol. So that gives a little background there. Another one was wonderful. Psalms 139.14. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. 
my soul knows it very well. We know a song like that, my soul knows very well. Okay. All right. And welcomed was another one. Romans 15, 7. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. And shielded was the last one. Psalms 3, 3. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I'm so grateful that God, he cares about our emotions, even though we don't listen to them or, you know, we have to combat them, if that makes sense sometimes. Um, they can be very loud, especially in our head. Um, but they don't have to be, right? God gives us verses and he gives us uh, examples and he gives us each other and he gives, I mean, there's all kinds of things. And most importantly, his word, so that we don't have to, we can quiet the noise. Does that make sense? So I'm very grateful for that. All of those verses help us to know who we are, uh, who we really are in him. So what is our action plan? How do we live that out? Now that we know who we are in him, uh, how do we live this way? Now that we know we have to change our mindset from fleshly thinking and allow our new spirit man to take over. So what does it take to do that? It takes courage to do that. Courage. That's what this sermon is all about. So there's two definitions of courage. One is the ability to do something that frightens one. So change. Change can be very scary, right? A lot of people don't like it. I didn't like it for the longest time. I still pray about it. Joshua 1.9. Uh, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Come on, wherever we go. That's right, even the bathroom, the Lord is with me. I'm, not to be weird, but I'm saying I'm grateful. <laughs> need, uh, you need courage to change. Change is uncomfortable, it can be scary, it can be difficult. You worry about how others might react. Um, it's, it's hard to change. Uh, one thing, um, things that we have to change are, again, kind of going back to reviewing the way that we talk, right? We don't want to talk negatively anymore, especially about ourselves. Like, oh, you know, I can never do anything right. We don't say that. We don't say what's wrong with me. We say what's right with me, right? Um, complaining, we, we definitely don't want to do that. We, we learned here that that's not biblical either. Um, and something that personally that I, I have removed from my vocabulary the best I can are two words, never and always. Because a lot of the times behind them comes negativity. Oh, you never do this anymore. You always used to do that, but now you don't do that anymore either. Like, you know, uh, so never and always are two things. And I challenge you to try to remove those or at least notice when you say them to try to pluck those out because that, those two words, it was hard for me. It took me a while. But that's a good challenge. And sometimes humor, humor, uh, you might have to change whether or not your humor is uh, appropriate or it might be a little dark. Um, sometimes if you're confrontational, right, um, you might have to stop bucking up to someone who you should be submitting to, right? That one was, uh, uh, when I was writing this one down, I'm like, yes, Lord, I'm okay, I'm typing. I'm like, yes, thank you, Jesus. So <laughs> examples would be like your boss, right? Or a coach, maybe, uh, a spouse, uh, maybe a doctor, right? And what stops us from doing these things is pride, when you think about it, when it all boils down to why you might be a little combative sometimes, or not you, I mean, we, you know. <clears throat> um, Proverbs 13.3 uh, in the NIV, those who guard their lips Those who guard their lips perverse their lives. Preserve. Praise the Lord. I knew I was looking at that wrong. Those who guard their lips preserve their lives. But those who speak rashly will come to ruin. Ha! Ah, right? Proverbs 15, 4. The soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. So what does that mean? That means we have to create boundaries. 
right, about things that we can and can't say or things that we can and can't do. That's another thing that we have to do to, that we have to have courage to be able to do. Set new rules, um, even when it comes to uh, dating or your spouse, you know, things that you will or will not talk about or tones that maybe you will or will not have, places that you will or will not go with your person that you're dating, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, you, you don't think about it until it comes time and you realize, okay, you know, once you get saved though and you walk into a door to a place where you shouldn't be, you know it. Like you walk in and you're like, this used to be fun. I don't, this is not working. Like you, you, you know, that's why I love the Holy Spirit because he tells you, he's like, no, no, let's not, let's not go here. Mm -mm. And the, uh, friends also, these are all kind of the same, you know, places that you go with your friends, things that you do with them, conversations that you have with them, uh, influences. Is, is this particular person in my life a good influence or maybe should I not call them as often or, you know, maybe get biblical or godly advice from someone else, possibly, you know, in church or, you know, at a Bible study, from the word itself, also very good. Uh, and also with your children, creating new boundaries with your children can be very difficult, especially if they're children, I mean, <laughs> any children. <laughs> so uh, if you are uh, applying God's principles in your life and you haven't been in the past, changing the mindset not only of yourself but changing the rules to your family also can be very difficult. You have to have courage to do that because it can be tough. There can be fits. Fits come in all ages too. I'm, I'm just pointing it out. Um, also, again, the way you, the way you talk um, about God with your children, just, just starting that up. I remember the first time we started talking to God with our kids, it was kind of, hey, so God loves you, all right? Like, it's, uh, <clears throat> we don't lie. I mean, um, you know, <laughs> it can be kind of awkward at first because, you know, uh, you don't, you're not really sure what to say. So a good thing, you can get into the word with your kids. They have children's devotionals and all kinds of things like that, if that's an option. Or grandchildren or great-grandchildren, grandma. Uh, it, all of those things are wonderful. And again, godly principles and praying together. Praying together is so important. Like, and not just like, God is great, God is good, let us sing and pour our food, amen. Like, you know, the, the kids' prayers, like, actually like, okay, like, talk to God. Like, that, that sometimes my kids don't understand or know if I'm praying or not because I, re I, I really talk to God just like everybody else. I'm like, oh, Okay, dear Lord, thank you so much. Like, okay, now today, oh, I'm going to need some help because I've, <laughs> like, I mean, I talk to God like I talk to regular people, reverently, of course. But, so uh, Romans 12, 2 uh, also helps us with our behavior. Do not copy the behavior and customs of this world, hmm. but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Oh, I love that. That is so good. Amen. Do not copy the behavior and cause it. What's this one say? Do not be conformed. It's the same thing, different version. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's right. Again, change the way you think, right? I love the different versions. That's what we do. Think. That's my next one. You have to have courage to change the way that you think. Again, it can be very difficult, especially if you are very accustomed to thinking certain ways. Uh, uh, grumbling of the mind, right? We all know what that sounds like. Oh, man. I say, mm -hmm. Like grumbling. In my head, it sometimes doesn't even have words. You don't even need to have words. You can just be grumbling. Negative thoughts. Uh, grumbling of the mind is like, like nonverbal bucking, you know? Uh, so that also is with the pride. So that's where uh, you have to change, I think, first, is the thinking. Dr. Caroline Leaf uh, says in her book, Switch on Your Brain, it says, as we think, we can change the physical nature of our brain. As we continuously direct our thinking, we can wire out toxic patterns of thinking and replace them with healthy thoughts. Um, and then 2 Timothy 1.7, 
And this particular version I really enjoy because I feel like we all know this one. For God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. Right? I do it with the kids. We have the hand motion. God has not given me a spirit. What do I do? Spirit of fear. What do I say? Like fear, like I do something like, ha, ah, right? But a power and a love and a sound mind, right? But this version I thought was, was really great. God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Boy, this one to me, it, it took me back. I mean, I got a lot of notes around this one. This one, it, like number one, timidity. It, when I was growing up, I remember a lot of the women, especially at church, I, I felt like they were very timid. They were like, oh, so, you know, sorry, uh, okay, you know, you want to do this? No, you don't? Okay, how can I? You know, and wh which to a, a certain extent, but timidity is a lack of confidence or courage. That's the definition of timidity. Um, there's a time and a place, I feel like, to be timid, um, but not at church. I just want to point that out. I get a little feisty about this one. I'm just going to be honest. Not at church. Um, I, God gave us power, for a reason. And this is where we're supposed to use it. This is where we woman up and we use it. We use the dominion and the authority that he gave us. We have to resist it. We have to resist the devil. The devil doesn't flee just because you're like, oh, Jesus, can you please pray about the devil? And he just bothered me today. And no, in the name of Jesus, devil, you will flee. Like, you, you have to get a little, you have, you have to, and, and again, the word that I used last time, unction, right? And so I looked it up, because I love the word so much. Unction, right, rises from a link between religious forever, I think, F-R-E-V-O-R, look that up too, hold on, and anointing with the Holy Spirit. Forever, <laughs> means intense passion or feeling. Come on. Like, like God gave us, women especially, more emotions than men, okay? Uh, I'm not trying to be sexist or any, you know, any of those things, like all that stuff, put it aside. Like, but we are more, emo I am way more emotional than my husband. Like, I, just flat out. Like, <laughs> he gave us that, and, and then he gave us power, to use against the devil, against the things that we are battling against. Are we battling against flesh and blood? No. No, we are not. We are battling against principalities and powers and rulers and darkness of the world. That's what we're fighting against. We're not fighting with each other. We're not fighting with the men. We're not fighting with the Baptists. We're not fighting, you know what I mean? Like, whatever. We're not fighting with anything except for the devil and his crew who can't come near me. I'm going to tell you that right now. That, right? That's how we have to do the unction, okay? So the unction, again, means intense passion or feeling. Anointed, which is the forever word, anointed with the Holy Spirit. Ha! Huh. I'm going to tell you, ladies, this is, this for me was like a, like an aha moment. Because I've always, especially learning, you know, I've always, you know, you have ups and downs emotionally, like your emotions can mess with you so much. And it can try to take control of you and try to keep you down. And, but no, like I used to, like I won't say hate because we're not allowed to use that word in my house. But I did not like emotions at all. Like I was like, oh, you're being emotional again. Like, you know, if you're saying something and then in your head you're like, why am I doing this? This is, I know I should just sit down. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Sometimes that happens if you are upset about something. But now I know that I know that I know that we have our emotions and our passion and things, that, our feelings, when anointed, are amazing. They can be amazing tools against, against the devil. I just, it gets me so excited. I'm sorry. <clears throat> oh, praise the Lord. So, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, we demolish arguments and every pretense that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We demolish arguments and every pretense, pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That's, 
Praise the Lord. I love the word of God. I'm just going to say it, 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 it has helped me so much. And I know, I know that it has helped you and it will continue to help you. We just got to get in it. That's what it's about. Praise the Lord. And again, he tells us what to think about. I'm going to probably read this every time because it's so important. Philippians 4, 8. Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Meditate on these things. Praise the Lord. So, the next thing we have to have courage to change is acting, how we act, our outwardly appearance, right? Because it starts in here and in here. We've learned that. Now we have to let it manifest, let it come out, let it boil over. It's scary to rearrange your calendar, right? Like Jeff was talking about on Thursday, um, to put God first on the calendar. But it says in Matthew 14 through, Matthew 5, 14 through 16, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine, right? Instead, they set it on a lampstand and it gives light unto everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Actions matter. They matter, right? It's one of the last things to change, I think, but definitely when they, once people start seeing you doing something different and, oh, why are you doing it like that? What do you mean you don't want to come to this you know, party? Or, what, you know, you used to tell me to do it like this all the time, and now you're like, no, no, that was probably wrong. <laughs> So that takes a lot of courage. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Be on your guard and stand firm in the faith. Be courageous and be strong. Those are all of the things that we need to change Once we, that we should work on continuously, that we will work on continuously. Praise the Lord. Uh, and the second, the second definition of courage is strength in the face of pain or grief. Mm -mm. The only way I knew how to deal with grief before I came to this church was to wallow, I'll be honest, um, lay in bed, sob, <laughs> but not anymore. <clears throat> no, I learned here, not only through the teaching of the word, but from the examples of the leadership that we have a different way to do it as Christians. We don't, we don't have to wallow in grief. We don't have to, no. There's, a, there's a, a definite better and biblical way to still grieve, yet not wallow. Uh, and that's one of the hardest things, I think, that we learn how to do in Christ. Psalms 34, 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Psalms 147.3, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. So, we all know what grief looks like, say, when we lose someone, or if, you know, the, when you say the word grief, you know, it's all, oh, like, you know, it's, you always think of the worst. But there's, like, there's many grief, right? There's not so bad grief. For example... Um, I experienced this this past week. My uh, children and I, uh, Catherine and William, my, my two oldest and middle child, uh, we heard about a play. And it was a play that did, um, it was a parody play. So they did songs, but like made them funny, like popular songs. And so we were very excited to do it because it involved children and adults and like I could be in it with them and like we were totally pumped. So there was an audition. So we go to the audition and, you know, we're sitting there and they're like, okay, who wants to be first, you know? And of course, no one is ever like, ah, I do. Uh, so um, after some coercion, a, one girl came up and she had like this background tape and like she was very diva and like, huh, like doing the whole thing. And Catherine's looking at me like, 
what am I doing here? <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, it's okay, it's okay. And then so after sitting down, after the girl sat down, uh, the lady who was filming everyone doing their auditions, by the way, which is, uh, you know, we're like, oh, it's going to be on video. Uh, <laughs> she, she was like, oh, that was my, 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 my vocal student, you know, and, you know, that was wonderful, and, you know, of course, and we're like, oh, my gosh. So then she's like, who wants to go next? And the kids are like, no, not even looking at me, you know, they're like looking on the ground, looking around, you know. And so I'm like, okay, okay, I'll just go. So I got up and did a little ditty and then sat down. And then Catherine got up and, you know, she sang a song that was, she did in school, like with her choir at school and she did it a cappella, and, you know, she's like doing a wonderful job and it wasn't perfect, but it was perfect to me because I'm her mom and I was so excited for her. It was great. And then William would not sing, you know, he was like, I'm not, I'm not going to stand up. I'm not, because he just turned seven. So he's like, mm-mm, this is not happening. So then after everyone sang, she started passing out um, th these papers and it, we had to all read lines. Right? So she's like, okay, you do this part, you do this part, you know. And then William read lines wonderfully. He did such a great job. And Catherine was doing lines like when she picked a second part, she made Catherine be the lead role. So she's like, I'm the lead. Like so anyway, so it was so exciting. And then um, afterwards, she's handing out, you know, all the paperwork, and she's like, okay, I'm going to get in touch with you guys, and it's going to be so great, you know, and she's like, I'll definitely, you know, have you three, you know, be involved. She was like, you know, you can help the little one if he has trouble, and I'm like, this is going to be so awesome. And then I get home, and I look at the schedule. Every single rehearsal was on Thursday night or Sunday. Every single one. So, I had to have the courage to tell my babies yeah. that we put God first right. and that it was fun and it was exciting and it looked really cool, but there will be other opportunities and those will be anointed. This one is not. Right. And we put God first. Yeah. Did they pout? Yes. Did they whine? Mm-hmm. But I had to explain it in such a way that they wouldn't resent going to church. Right. You know what I mean? Because you still want them to go. You still want them to love God, right? But at the same time, if you know, you can't do this because you got to go to church. Well, I don't want to go to church. Baby, we don't say that at our house. No. <laughs> but you know what I mean. So that was maybe an example of a mini grief because that as, as that was, it was hard for the kids. But I'm very proud of them that they were like, no. At the end of the conversation, they were like, no, you're right, Mom. We should go to church. I said, praise the Lord, my baby. That's so good. So, <clears throat> sometimes being courageous or having courage, um, for lack of a better term, sucks. <laughs> Pardon my bluntness. But uh, also, you know what else may have sucked? Um, dying on the cross for something you didn't do. Amen. Amen. Like, Jesus had courage. Yeah. He, he was thinking about all of us when he did that. Yeah. Mm. He was brave, and he, he was brave so that we could face fear and overcome it. Yeah. And brave means to face and endure danger or pain. That's what brave means. Jesus was brave. We should be like him. We can, because he is in us, and we live from the inside out. So how do we do all of these things that I just went through? There's a lot of things, I know, after going through it myself, or reading through it, I'm like, these are a lot of things that we all need to change, even myself, we have some things to work on. That's okay, because we change them with seeds, yeah. little steps, little things every day, one thing, one different thought, one different, uh, maybe not today, one different action, one different tone of voice, even, with someone else. Uh, the seed of faith that is planted in your heart by hearing the word, that's where the seed of faith germinates. And germinate, I looked up. It means to grow and to put out shoots after a period of dormancy. Ah, that struck me so much because we are a society of, you know, I want everything right now and instant gratification and I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to be so different tomorrow. It's going to be awesome. And after a period of dormancy, you may not see or feel or... That was the biggest thing for me personally that changed my walk with Christ because I started saying it even if I didn't 
think it or feel it. Like, I was like, no, okay, I'm going to give this a chance, okay, I am, I'm blessed, okay, great. <laughs> Honestly, that's how it started, and that was my seed. Like, I, you know, I, I, we have faith, I trust you, Lord, to, you know, and, and it wasn't sarcastic, it, it was a seed. And every day, you change something, you do something, even if you say the same thing, I trust you, that's my favorite thing to say during praise and worship, is I trust you. I trust you because that is so important for us to know and to know and to like know all throughout us is that we can trust him. Trust is, we all have trust issues or maybe not we all, I'm not going to speak that on you, but I'm saying a lot of people today have trust issues. It's hard to trust people because we've all been let down and it happens because we're people, right? We're fallible, but the infallible one lives in us and we can trust him. We can Second definition of, of germinate, to come to existence and develop. The example they gave was the idea germinated and slowly grew into an obsession. It's okay with me if Jesus is my obsession, I'm just going to say. And the idea of writing a song, uh, uh, the idea of a songwriting partnership began to germinate in his mind. I mean, he thought it was a good idea. He was like, wait a minute. You know what would be really good? Singing with Paul McCartney. That would be awesome. For the sinner. Okay. In, in order for faith to germinate, you have to water it. How do you water it, Samara? I'll tell you. By meditating on the word, right? Is it, I mean, a lot of the advice or a lot of the uh, solutions to the problems that we're giving aren't necessarily new. It's all kind of the same. Get in the word. Like, that's, get into the word. Like, it, again, one verse, one verse a day. You read one verse a day, they have Bible apps that will pop it up on your phone. This is the verse for the day. You've read your one verse, right? Like Pastor Kurt said, at the end of a year, you have read 365 verses. That's great. So meditate on the word. Read it. Think about it. Mull it over. Speak the word. Like, my example of, you know, I trust you. Yes. This is what, like, just, again, just start somewhere and say it every day. Say it, let it get, it, it gets into you, right? Because faith cometh by hearing and hearing and hearing. Also, the third thing, declare it. <laughs> I looked up that word too. So, declaring had multiple definitions. Other than like declaring your taxes and declaring things at customs, because I didn't include those because they did not pertain. So the first definition, say something in a solemn and empathetic way manner. So I was, the example, they gave examples of everything, and then I have a different examples of everything that they gave. I was under too much pressure, he declared. I am a doer of the word, she declared. The second definition, formally announce the beginning or state of, I'm sorry, the beginning of a state or condition. Formally announce the beginning of a state or condition. Their example, Spain declared war on Britain in 1796. My example, or God's example, I will fight the good fight of faith and declare war on the devil, resisting him any chance I get. You have to resist. You have to resist. Being a Christian isn't passive. And it, it took me a while to figure that out. It's not, you've got to have an unction. <laughs> Another definition. Pronounce or assert a person or thing to be something specific. Their example. The mansion was declared a fire hazard. Godly example. I declare that I am a child of the living God. Next definition, openly align oneself, openly align oneself for or against a party or position in a dispute. Mr. Roosevelt had declared for a new deal. I declare that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. The last definition, 
express feelings of love to someone. She waited in vain for him to declare himself. That sounds sad. I declare that I will love the Lord my God with all of my heart, all of my soul, and all of my mind. Faith comes alive in your heart, and while you are doing these things, and you slowly begin to realize who you are. Doing those three things, speaking, meditating, declaring, you're conditioning yourself. You have to condition your flesh. If you want something nice and done right in the natural, a lot of it requires a period of time where you prepare or condition. For example, like fighters, right? I read a lot of articles where they have to do a lot of, about nutrition and lifting weights and practicing taking hits, which did not sound fun to me. Um, we condition our hair, right? So that uh, hair that is prone to breakage will no longer be so. Uh, you condition a baseball glove when you get it, or softball. Um, you know, for the leather in the glove, because it's tough when you get it. Uh, you condition your fish tank, right? When you get some fish, you have to pour the conditioning solution into it and check the pH and do the air pump. And I learned a fun new word. You have to put aquascape into your fish tank, which I thought was, I think that's just a fancy word for coral, but I like aquascape. Also, um, a thought of my gram, uh, you condition a cast iron skillet, right? You coat it with the oil and you bake it at 350 for about an hour. Um, you know, all those things. So all of those things that we take such care in the natural to condition and to make sure that they are nice and that we can use them and, you know, that they make things taste good or won't kill our fish or, you know, whatever. All of those are things. None of them are eternal. Not a single one of them. And we take such time and such care to prepare all of those things. You have to take even more time to prepare yourself, to prepare your, you know, to train your flesh, condition your flesh, to unlearn all of the things that it has learned as you have grown up. So once you condition yourself, your heart, your mind, your soul and flesh, and you're built up in the spirit by meditating on the word and speaking the word and declaring the word, you can release your faith and pray with results. Amen. With results. Right. You can bind this and you can resist that and you can claim your authority and the dominion that he has given us. Dominion is the right to make decisions and to rule. Dominion does not necessarily mean ownership, but rulership. Use the word. He's given it to us for a reason. We're supposed to use it. We're supposed to. It teaches us how to be in him, literally. Psalms 115, 16. The highest of heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to mankind. We have dominion over the earth. So we should you know, pray the verses over ourselves also, you know, God, lead me not into temptation, deliver me from evil, right? Evil is not just, you know, a little, like, you know, evil is all around us. Like, we are, we are, um, like, what is it, aliens, it, it, this is not our world. Like, once we become saved, we are not, no longer in our home. Our home is up there, or it's in heaven. Our home is not here. So, we're in someone else's turf. So that's why they're always coming at us. So we always have to be prepared. Put on your armor. You can put it on anytime while you're brushing your teeth in the car with your kids. Okay, and it tells us, Deuteronomy 6, 7 through 9, message translation. Write these commandments that I have given you today on your hearts. Get them inside of you. Get them inside your children. Talk about them wherever you are, sitting at home or walking in the street. Talk about them from the time you get up in the morning to when you fall into bed at night. Tie them to your hands and foreheads as a reminder. Inscribe them on the doorposts of your home and on your city gates. That one to me I thought was super cool because, you know, sometimes you walk into people's houses and they got verses on the wall or they got, you know, whatever. And, and before, years ago, I would walk into somebody's house and be like, oh, that's, uh, you know. But they were doing what they were told. Like, shame on me. They were doing what they were told to do. 
It says, put them up in your house. Put them on the doorpost of your home. Put it on your forehead. Like, my mom always has scriptures on the mirrors in the bathroom so that when you are washing your hands, you, you have something to read. And it's biblical. Uh, or brushing your teeth. You know, when I was a kid, I was always like, why does she have all this stuff all around? Now I know, because it's, it's, God told her to. That's why. Luke 145, blessed is she, again, another verse for ladies specifically, blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. Come on now. We are blessed if we believe God's word. We are blessed. Like, all of his promises, they're mine, they're yours. Like, all we got to do is own it, right? Like, there's a difference between being like a fair weather fan, right? And maybe it's kind of like that. So that. Oh, I only like the Bucks when they're doing really great. Like, you know, like, oh, the Bucks are winning. That's so great. No, it takes courage to be a Bucks fan when they're losing most of the time. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm just saying. <laughs> So uh, I would like to close with a little chunk of the word, right? Because God gave us choice, right? And we need to choose to be courageous. We need to be doers of the word by first meditating it, speaking it, and declaring it in our lives. Take baby steps, right? Don't be hard on yourself. Just do it. If you forget a day, it's all right. There's tomorrow. Do it again. Just don't, just remember to do it. Set an alarm in your phone. I had to do that sometimes. Read your Bible. I'm like, oh, man. The alarm goes off, you know, but once you, then you get excited about it. Like you get pumped about the word. I never even thought that it would happen, but I'm telling you, it's exciting. I'm about to show you something right here. Okay. So we get fired up about the word. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to read you Colossians and I'm going to, sorry, Brad, Colossians three in the message translation. I, I, I read this and I was, <laughs> I was in my daughter's room using her desk. And like her door is right here. And then like out, you go out to the living room type of thing. And my husband was out there. And I'm like, babe, you know what the Bible says? I'm like, because <laughs> I hadn't read this whole thing all the way through. Because it's very important. I feel like all of the verses are important, right? They're all, they all mean something and we can all get something from them. But when you read them all together and understand the context in which they come from, bro, like, uh, I get so excited. So uh, this one specifically this uh, is called He Is Your Life, is the because you know sometimes they have titles above the, the chapters. So this is in the message translation. So if you see if you're serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, act like it. Oh Lord, come on now. Act like it. Pursue the things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorbed with things right in front of you. Look up. And be alert to what is going on around Christ. That's where the action is. See things from his perspective. Your old life is dead. Just walk it off. It's dead. Your new life, which is, which is your real life, even though it's invisible to spectators, right? Because we're changed from the inside out. Okay? So is with Christ in God. He is your life. When Christ, your real life, remember shows up again on this earth, you'll show up too. The real you, the glorious you. Meanwhile, be content with obscurity like Christ. And I, and I looked up obscurity just, just to, you know, because I like to. Uh, so obscurity means things that are not discovered or known about, uncertain, not seen, concealed, right? What does that mean? We don't have to have the answers to everything. We don't have to know why this is happening or why that's happening or why this is not happening, right? Because I know we're all, sometimes that happens. Like, we're all like, God, why is this not working out? I don't understand. We don't need to know. Honestly, it says in here, be content with obscurity. That one's, that one's good. That was good for me. Praise the Lord. And that means killing off everything connected with the way of death. Sexual promiscuity, impurity, lust, Mm -hmm. Here we go. Doing whatever you feel like, whenever you feel like. Ooh. At, <laughs> I made the joke, like, that's why we become adults, right? I'm going to do what I want. I'm an adult. Nope. 
not, nope, not anymore. <laughs> if that's what you were doing. No, nope. and so whenever the kids are like, I can't wait to be an adult because I can do what I want. And I say, baby, it's not that way. That's not how it works. Get it in your head now. Know that in, in your spirit, that's not how it's going to work. We do things of God. And grabbing whatever attracts your fancy. That's a life shaped by things and feelings instead of God. It's because of these kind of things that God is about to explode in anger. It wasn't long ago that you were doing all, the, all that stuff and not knowing any better. But you know better now. So make sure it's gone for good. Here we go. Different things. Bad temper. Irritability. Sometimes. Meanness. Profanity. Dirty talk. No more. We're going to wash that right out with, with the blood of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Don't lie to one another. Okay? So, also this means if you have an accountability partner, just own up. Right? Like, that's what we're there for, to help each other, okay? No, no condemnation. Let's just be there for each other like we're supposed to be. You're done with that old life. It's like a filthy set of ill-fitting clothes you've stripped off and put into the fire. Now you're dressed in a new wardrobe. Every item of your new way of life is custom made by the creator with his label on it. We don't need no Gucci. We got Jesus. Come on. All the old fashions are now obsolete. Words like Jewish and non-Jewish, religious and irreligious, insider, outsider, uncivilized and uncouth, slave and free mean nothing. For, it that, doesn't matter your race, doesn't matter your creed, doesn't matter whatever. That's what that means. Jesus loves you no matter what. From now on, everyone is defined by Christ. Everyone is included in Christ. So, chosen by God for this new life of love, dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you. What's your wardrobe look like? Compassion, kindness, humility. Humility is uh, free from pride or arrogance, by the way. Quiet strength, discipline. Be even-tempered, content with second place. Quick to forgive an offense. Forgive as quickly and completely as the master forgave you, capital M. And regardless of what else you put on, wear love. It's your basic all-purpose garment. It's better than cotton. That's right. Never be without it. Let the peace of Christ keep you in tune with each other, in step with each other. None of this going off and doing your own thing, which again, I think goes back to accountability. Like, Let's stick with each other. Like, are you going to make mistakes? Yes. Does it sometimes hurt to admit your mistakes? Yes. But do we need to hold each other up? Yes. yes. Most definitely. Praise the Lord. And cultivate thankfulness. Let the word of Christ, the message, have the run of the house. Give it plenty of room in your lives. Instruct and direct one another using good common sense. And sing, sing your hearts out to God. Come on. Let every detail in your lives, words, actions, whatever, which is basically what we went through before, be done in the name of the Master, capital M, Jesus, thanking God the Father every step of the way. Wives, understand and support your husbands by submitting to them in a way that honors the Master, capital M. You're not, you're not honoring them in a way that or you're not submitting to them in a way that honors them. You're submitting to them in a way that honors God, which is very different. Husbands, go all out in love for your wives. Don't take advantage of them. Children, do what your parents tell you. This delights the master to no end, capital M. Parents, don't come down too hard on your children or you'll crush their spirits. Servants, do what you're told by your earthly master, little m. And don't just do the minimum, I'm telling you this last part, don't just do the minimum that will get you by, do your best. Work from the heart of your real master, capital M, for God, confident that you will get paid in full when you come into your inheritance. Are you going to do things sometimes that seem unfair? Yep. That's right. But we suck it up 
and we do it because we're supposed to, because we love God, and because he tells us to. Praise the Lord. Our inheritance comes for that at the end. I'm okay with doing things down here that I don't get recognition or paid for or whatever because I know that God's always looking. More than Santa. I tell my children that. Santa's not real. <laughs> uh, in your inheritance, right? Keep in mind always that the ultimate master you are serving is Christ. Here we go. Here we go. This is the one. This is the clincher. The sullen servant who does shoddy work will be held responsible. Being a follower of Jesus doesn't cover up bad work. Mm, ouch and amen. Here we go. All right, so now I have homework for everyone. It's so exciting. All right, so the homework that I wanted to give you was to find the antonym for your flesh, right? Synonyms are words that are the same as something else, right? Antonyms are words that are opposite, okay? So if you struggle with fear, look up um, scriptures on faith or look up, look up the word fear, find the antonyms for them, and, you know, focus on those things. It's literally like opposites. If you feel as though you are being a burden to someone, right, flip it. Be a blessing, yeah. right? Work on that. Find one thing that you're struggling with right now in your own personal life and literally find the antonym. Do the opposite. And then not only will you be able to find opposite words like maybe in the dictionary or whatever, but you'll be able to find verses in the Bible. Just look at it. There's a concordance in the back or like, you know, there's all kinds of information. You can Google the word, like all kinds of information. So find one thing that you're struggling on that you really want to change or that you've been working on changing and find the antonym and then apply it, right? We're not victims, we're victorious. That's what we are. By the word of God, God tells us to be courageous and he doesn't tell us to do something that he doesn't equip us to do. So we are able to be courageous. We just got to get our unction, right? So be courageous, plant your seeds, condition, work on conditioning yourself and constantly contemplate the word. And in all of those things, we will be in him. Yeah. Bow your heads, please. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for today and this time and this word that you've given us. I thank you so much that we have learned to do something, to change something, one thing even, in our lives so that we can be more like you and we can learn to live our lives in you from the inside out like we're supposed to. I thank you, Lord, that you will be with us every step of the way and that we will be create courageous. We will find our unction. We will use the things and the gifts that you have given us to glorify you. Thank you, Father, that we will all have safe trips home. And I um, thank you, Lord, that you are amazing. Uh, I thank you for all of the creations that you've given us and for all of the things that you do for us on a daily basis that we may not even recognize. I love you so much, and thank you, um, thank you for allowing me to be your vessel. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you. Good word. Thank you so much. Praise God. The word says he's made us able to be partakers of the saints. She's, she's giving us all these ideas and sharing all the word about the new life he has for us. He's made us able, able to take part in that. We come into him, he changes our nature, and then we work it from the inside out. We work it from the inside out, just like what she was saying. He's made us more than able to be partakers of the inheritance of the new life. And we're going to be talking more about, you know, we are spirit, soul, and body, is what the word of God says. We are in him, in the spirit. How do we... How do we bring that out where we can walk it? The scripture she was reading, it's really amazing all the different versions of um, the, the word. Sometimes she was reading the message, and, and doesn't it make you sometimes go, where is that in my Bible? <laughs> it makes you stop and go back to the scripture and go, what? where is that? And it's pretty cool. But that's what the word is talking about, how we can walk out in our soulish realm, and then the flesh just follows. As one teacher put it, like the tail on a dog. It just comes along. You know, when we get our inside straight and the soul lined up and we walk it in the flesh. So praise God.
He's good. He's doing a great work. Afterward, um, Samara and I will be up here if you if anyone wants prayer.